Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. I'm Dan, alongside Matt, as always, and we also want to give a shout-out this week to someone that not everybody hears from this week, or any week, actually, someone who's a huge help to us behind the scenes, and that's our man Peter Marino, our producer, who makes us sound great every week, and a shout-out to the friend of the show, Beasley. You've, if you've ever been to the Saddle Dome, you've heard Beasley. He's the in arena voice of the Flames. Matt, can you believe Bees is celebrating 25 years as the voice of the Flames? That's an impressive milestone, and he has done an absolutely excellent job for the Flames. He's a fantastic voice. It's sort of it, it's going to be like Peter Marr, right? Peter Marr's so iconic that when he left, it was weird not hearing him. And when Bees eventually isn't there, it's going to be weird, and it's not shoes I'd want to fill. Yeah, and it's even like if you go uh, a different route, like when Heather Liscano left uh, from doing the national anthems, like that... Uh, change was definitely felt for a while until they got onto George Canyon. Yeah, I remember them having some just random folks nobody ever knew who they were. So, congratulations, Bees, 25 years, and I don't know, I don't know if he's got it in him, but let's hope for 25 more. That'd be fun. And so Matt and uh, Matt and I, we've got, we're not just going to get sit here and talk about Beasley all day, but we got some Flames hockey to talk about, and Matt, it's been a heck of a road trip. Yeah, it's been an odd one. The, the first two games, they didn't really look too hot. The, the third one was, you know, the day after a Saturday night in Vegas, so kind of understandable. And then the fourth one, they lost, and they probably should have won that one. So it's been a weird up-and-down week, and yet they went 500, so not really much to complain about. Well, let's break these down here so everyone knows exactly which games you're talking about. The first game on this road trip was Calgary in L.A. It was Daryl Sutter and his merry band of men going back to L.A. to his old stomping grounds. And I would have been surprised if the team lost this one. I think there was enough probably pressure from the coach to win this one. And they did. They ended up with a 3-2 win over the Kings. We got Flames goals from uh, Mongepani, Lucic, and Matthew Kachuk in this one. They didn't score first for once, which was weird going into this one. And I don't know what you meant, but when I watched this, I thought it was almost the Calgary Flames versus the L.A. Flames. Like the L.A. Fl- the L.A. Kings played a very Calgary Flames game. Yeah, and it was interesting to see. The Flames really have not faced a team that plays their exact game. Like, they did against Boston, but, like, frankly, Boston struggled a lot in that game. And, you know, like, this was the first, frankly, true test of this team in a completely different type of game than they're used to. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to say it. The Flames were 0-2-1 against division rivals coming into this one and their first divisional win of the season and their 10th road win in a row at this point. And I think you're right. I mean, the Flames really played the first team that plays like them, and... You could definitely see that while we won, this was a hard-fought win. This wasn't as easy or maybe as much of a styles clash as we've seen in the past. I thought the Flames really had to work hard for this win. Yeah, and you look in past years, the Kings, while they've been rather terrible, have always managed to get up for games against the Flames due to the Kachuk-Doughty rivalry. And it really, frankly, is spinning off from there. And so, like, I came into this game expecting the Kings to give the Flames a little bit of a hard time just because of that. And the Flames, to their credit, rose to the occasion and collected the 3-2 win. I enjoyed watching this one. I think it was one of the more... I don't want to say one of the better games to watch because there's been a lot of fun games of Flames fan, but I found this to be the most... It almost felt like we were playing chess on ice. It felt like everyone had a move and a counter move the whole game. Yeah, I agree. And Jacob Marster made an impressive 40 staves in this game, which, I mean, I don't know. When you're getting 40 shots in your net, you probably shouldn't be winning a lot of hockey games. And I think that's been the story of this Flames team, is they're finding ways to defend, even though they're letting in a lot of shots in a lot of games. Oh, and also, to be a little fair, I think the shot counter in L.A. is a little bit trigger-happy with shots for the Kings. Because it really did not seem like 40 shots went in That's on true. Markstrom. 
I was kind of surprised when I watched it back and I was looking at the score sheet after. I'm like, really? There's 40 shots? Yeah, because like, it, it seemed more like... Like, I could see 30, but it just it did, did not feel like a 40-shot game. Matt, it says on the internet, so it must be true. Yes, exactly. Well, we've, heard, we've heard, seen that kind of thing happen uh, other times that the Flames have been in the Staples Center, so it's just kind of a trend that perhaps they're a little bit... Uh, trigger happy with the shot counts for the Kings. Could be. I haven't. I haven't really paid attention to that specific arena. Yeah. Well, that was December second, and then the next night, December third, the Flames were just down the street in Anaheim. Um, Dan Vladar was our starter in this one, and the Calgary Flames won four to three. Uh, in this one, it was a. I would say a better. Better overall game for the Flames, I thought. The Flames won a shootout game in this, and I thought better in a few ways. Some people would say, well, why better? The Flames had to go to the shootout. I thought the Flames showed more resiliency in this game. Yeah, and like in overtime, they didn't panic uh, when they easily could have. Um, and the first period wasn't great, and they showed they can pick it up when they don't have a great first period. Yeah, and... You know, the Flames, frankly, need to figure out different ways of winning. And, like, it's all great to blow out teams or uh, shut them out. But, you know, you're not always going to score first. And you're not always going to have your best efforts. And the fact that this team, despite not playing particularly great throughout the entirety of the game, was able to force it to the shootout where it was over quick. The the first goal, again, not scored by the Flames in this one. But I think that, you know, with the not-so-great first period, I was looking at this, and I was thinking to myself when I was watching it, are the Flames going to end up like last year's Flames, and when the first period doesn't go well, they just stop going, or are they going to figure this out? And they figured it out. Yeah, and it was nice to get another win in the Honda Center. Hopefully that trend normalizes where it's not, a, you know, question if Calgary can win, but oh well, Calgary's going to win this game. Yeah, and the Flames got up three to one in this one, which we'll see later in the week as well, and then let that slide. But I think the important thing is they got up three to one, they let that slide a little bit, but they managed to seal the deal. I mean, yeah, we had to give up a point to the Ducks to do it, but they still managed to you know get the lead, lose the lead, and then win the game. Yeah, and the perseverance of losing the lead and then holding it till overtime, you know, like, Anaheim really is not going to contend for the division over the course of the season. Like, they're close to the Flames in the standings, but, you know, losing a point to them, I don't see as being a huge impact to this team. And so with them... You know, not having quite as much attention to details and allowing the Ducks in. Normally, like, what we see from this team is that the, they would have scored a fourth and a fifth one and, you know, rode off into the sunset in regulation with a huge win. And we didn't see that in this game, which was a nice thing to see. An interesting change to the lineup in this one was seeing Lucic on the second line with Backlund and Mangiapane. He replaced Blake Coleman on the second line. Not where I expect him to be that high in the lineup, but he had a really great night in L.A., and I think this was just the coach rewarding him for that great night. And I thought that line looked better than I thought it would be. Yeah. Well, Lucic has been, to his credit, a very much an improved player thus far this season, and he deserves some rewards. For sure. So we won in the Honda Center. That curse has been broken and remains broken. We can continue to win there. But the next game is the new Honda Center curse. The Flames have yet to win in Las Vegas against the Vegas Golden Knights, and that was true of this next game as well. On December 5th, the Flames played the Golden Knights and dropped this game 3-2. to And, Matt, I feel like... Uh, Vegas is sort of becoming our arch nemesis at this point. It just seems like we we can't find a way to solve them. They beat us here, we beat them there. Like it's not just us winning in in uh, not winning in Vegas. It just feels like this team, and we're not the only ones. I mean, they're they've been a good team for years, but they seem like they're a tough group to solve. Yeah, well, plus Calgary, like frankly, with the start of the season that they had, a little R and R between games uh, from Anaheim to Vegas. 
you know, like, and it being a Saturday night, like, it kind of makes sense that the team was a little sluggish. Like, I know that's not an excuse for anything, but, you know, like... They've been on the road a lot. Yeah, and, you know, it, it is what it is. Like, the team, they did try hard towards the end of the game. They did get within one. They nearly tied it, if not for a uh, puck off the crossbar. You know, it if the flame like despite playing poorly for most of the game, they could have salvaged a point had they had better puck luck off the the crossbar. I think that's a fair way to say it. Yeah. Um, anything else about this game you want to talk about? To me, it was just another Golden Lights game, but I think I I thought the Flames held their own better against the Golden Knights this time, even though we lost. And I think it really shows that this is an improved team. Yeah, and frankly, I was kind of disappointed over on the overall by Vegas's level of play. I did not think that they were as good as we've seen them, frankly. And, you know, like, to a point where it's, like, significantly not as good. So... We'll see if that continues throughout the season or not. But, like, they did not seem as intimidating a team as we Well, they're we've missing seen. some guys, too. True. It's just, on the overall, it just they kind of seem flat. And we should note here that this was Adam Rogishka's first NHL game in, in this one. He came into the lineup uh, for the first time this season after being called up from the Stockton Heat. And he was on a line, I believe, pretty much the whole game with Richardson and Lewis. Yeah, which makes sense. And speaking of Ruzhishka, the next game, uh, the Calgary Flames went back to California to play the Sharks, and Ruzhishka got his first NHL goal, again playing on that line. He scored the, scored the third goal in this game, the first of the second period, with Tan Evan Richardson assisting him. So congrats to him. Vladar was back in net for this one. Um, I guess the other interesting lineup note is Lucic, Dubé, Monaghan was a line, and I thought that line actually looked really good. Yeah, uh, like this is one of those games that, despite losing the game five to three, that if the Flames played this game repetitively, they probably would have went, won most of them, just because they outchanced the Sharks and they outplayed them for most of the game. It's just that three-two goal that you know caused the Flames to kind of get buried, and they just couldn't pull up in time. I thought that our defensive core in this one left a lot to be desired. True. Compared to the other games in the trip and the other games this season, I think there was a glaring hole there. Yeah, like all of the defensemen were bad. Like, it's hard to single out one guy. Like, all six had their moments of, like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, I thought it was nice to see Rajishka getting a goal. I thought the Lucic, Monaghan, Dubé line had some interesting chemistry, so there was some interesting things going on up front. Um, Dan Vladar got handed his first regulation loss of the season and his first regulation loss is a flame. But I think to me, the story of this game was sort of the defensive breakdown. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, and, and Tanev didn't look, I mean, Tanev's usually kind of a rock. I'd say his whole trip, he hasn't looked good. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe no, he's nursing something. No. And frankly, like the whole team just seems to be getting a little bit away from the attention to detail that we've seen from them through the first 24 games and i don't know if they're just tired or what's going on well it is a little exhausting going out on the road for basically the full two month first two months of the season and you know hopefully like as things start to settle down on that aspect and you're starting to see them playing in calgary more that the consistency in that situation will resume I hope so. I hope we can get back to it because I think that the defense is going to be a huge part of our uh, a, a huge part of our success this year if we do have success. Mm-hmm. And without a consistent defensive core, they can't be showing up sometimes and not others. Without a consistent defensive core, we're going to be in a little bit of trouble. Oh, definitely. And you know, like you can't really go with a struggling defense core where like over half is just not acceptable. Like, you need to have guys step up, and whether it's, you know, guys like Tanev or the younger guys to fill in properly. 
Well, that concludes this week for the Flames. Four games on the road, four games through what we would usually call the California swing, uh, which usually, it's weird because that used to usually include Arizona. Now it includes Vegas um, in that California swing, I guess because the divisions change. That's why. And now the Flames come home for a couple and then they're back on the road. So it's a, it's a crazy schedule for them. Yeah. And, you know, to be fair with the uh, Vegas game, like that was also their third game in four nights. That's true. And fourth game in six nights for the San Jose game. So, like, it it is a little bit hard to be going that hard on travel and then having to play so repetitively. Well, and that's why you and I have said a few times that these guys need to rack up the points when they can because looking at their road schedule, and this road schedule doesn't cease anytime soon, um, they're, they're going to have stretches like this, and they need to have the points in the bank. Mm-hmm. And we can see that this week. I mean, the Flames, arguably, I'd say, have probably had the worst week of the season so far in terms of play. And they're still first in the Pacific with 35 points. Anaheim's right behind them with 33. If we look at where they sit in the Western Conference now, they are uh, second in the conference still with only Minnesota ahead of them. And in the league, they are eighth. So still doing pretty well. The Flames record after 26 games is 15, 6, and 5. Um, and, and I think this is one of those weeks where we didn't have a great week and our, our banked points really helped us. Yeah, definitely. So looking, I guess, looking at this uh, road trip and looking at sort of where this story is, and I, and I, as I said to you, I really like the, the look at that Dubé, Lucic, Monaghan line that we saw in the San Jose game. I think there's a little bit of everything there. We've seen Lucic over his time in Calgary, but especially this season showing a little more offensive prowess. Um, I think and I that, think that also has to do with uh, his skating and the amount of work that he put in, in the off season. Like I've noticed that his first step and the time it takes him to get to full speed has reduced significantly. Could be the off season, and then they also have a skating coach for the first time. Yeah, and I think like all of that has culminated into his overall skating game improving. Yeah, I think probably, like you said, some off-season work, some regular work on the road. Um, he's looking better. But I really like Dubé and, and Monaghan with him. We know what Monaghan's role is in that line. We know what Dubé's role is. Or, sorry, we know what Monaghan's role is. We know what Lucic's role is. But what we don't really know, not just on that line, but in general, who is Dylan Dubé? Not only who is he, but who do the Flames want him to be? And I think a big reason we've seen Mangiapane move ahead the way that he has is is his role's been clearly defined. But I feel like Dubé's still sort of in this weird no-man's land where so, sometimes he's a checker, sometimes he's a, an offensive player, sometimes he's a winger, sometimes he's a center. Um, so I, I don't know, and Matt, I know you're high on Dubé. I don't know that we can really get him maturing the way that Mangiapane has until we can assign him a role, like a, a fixed role night in, night out. What do you think? Well, it doesn't help with Dubé that, um, like, he doesn't really have a fixed position. Like, he can play on either wing, he can play center, and it's kind of just like, well, what do we need right now? And just throw Dubé in whichever spot. And, you know, like, the Flames need him to broaden his horizons much in the way that Eat Bread did, and evolve his game and take those next steps and while he has improved a bit it's not to the extent that we would hope uh especially with the immense potential he had when he was drafted and i think you really need to find what you want him to be not just put him on a side which i agree with i think you can move him from wing to wing occasionally um but i think you got to define what wing he is and I think it makes sense that he's a right wing just because we seem to be short there. <laughs> but I like some games we see him sort of trying to – it's almost like he's telling Milan Lucic, hold my beer, and he's trying to go kind of check for check with Lucic and be more of a checking forward, almost in a Sam Bennett vein. Um, and then sometimes we see him trying to play more the offensive forward, and I think the team needs to sit him down and say, you know what, either you are – and I don't mean this word to be disparaging, but either you're none of those things and you're just kind of a general floater, which, I mean, we've seen guys make a living being that, but you're not going to improve that way and we're okay with you being a, a bottom six floater in our team. Or I think you've really got to start defining that role. And if you keep playing him with Monaghan 
and uh, Lucic, I think you can there. I think in that role, he could really become the sort of the trigger man for Sean Monaghan. I think he could become the playmaker there. But I think for him to move forward and for him to become the top six, I think we all want him to be, He they need to define who this guy is. You know, so Matt, I think, you know, we've got to figure out who he is in that lineup. And I think we need to not only let him know that, but let his teammates know that so he can be used effectively. If we're supposed to pass to him, we need his teammates to know that. If he's supposed to pass somebody else, we need his teammates to know that. If he's supposed to yeah. go in the corners and dig around, his teammates need to know that. And and it just feels like right now, he's just sort of... I, I don't want to say he's the epitome of the Flames of previous years, but he just seems to kind of be freelancing and doing a little bit of everything. Yeah, and it's hard to nail down exactly... And it, part of it's on him, too. Like, he hasn't really taken... He's kind of been the everyman. Like, he's kind of good at each of the various parts, but not good enough where you can establish him as this or that or this or that. And it's... He just needs to show something more in uh, one or more of the aspects of his game, and we're just not seeing that right now. You know, I I don't know if I would um, I don't know if I'd say that he's not good at any one of those. I think in well, a lot of ways he hasn't been given the opportunity to become that. Yeah, it. How would you say like um, not elite at any of those things? Like he's just kind of there and he does the job adequately. Okay, so so that's an interesting question. When you're saying not elite, what do you think his upside is? Do you think his upside is an elite NHLer? I think that uh, his upside is like a, a decent quality uh, two-way second line winger or center. Okay. So, I Basically mean... Basically, Michael Backlund plus maybe some more offense. So, in that case, then, he doesn't really need to be elite because he's not going to be an elite team for the for the Flames. I don't think anyone would call Backlund an elite player. Possibly an elite defensive player, but that, it, you know, it. how would you say, um, it? this is one of those where, like, it took Backlund until he was, like, 25, 26. I was about to say that. It took Backlund a while to find that role. You know, and uh, Dubé, he's kind of learning on the fly how to do all the parts that he needs to. Because, like, it, how would you say, he does not have breakaway speed, just like Backlund. Uh, but, like, he's fairly smart and knows how to play and like where to play and he's responsible enough defensively that like if he can refine and continue to build and add on to those parts of his game he can be a really good effective player but you know like the current iteration of Dylan Dubé is kind of a almost replaceable if need be type player yeah. and which isn't a bad thing it's just you know, like, it, by this point in his career, you're kind of hoping that he's a little further ahead than he is right at the moment. And, again, that's not a bad thing. It's just, you know. In some ways, his development curve sort of reminds me of Sam Bennett, where, you know, Bennett had... We saw streaks of offensive prowess with Bennett, and then we saw his... What I think he became known for, which is more of his physical game. And there's a little bit of both, but he often couldn't play both at once. He could only kind of do one at a time. Yeah. And I think that Dylan Dubé is in that same mold where he can do any one of those things okay, like you said, at a you know an okay level, a serviceable NHL level. But if you do think that this guy is, you know, and it's second line caliber, I think we've got to start. And he's only 23, so we can't, you know, we can't necessarily say that he's ready for all those things yet. But I think they've got to start moving him in one direction. Yeah, and you know, part of the positives of like the Flames drafts over the last handful of years is that you've got guys like Pospisil, Ruzitska, Phillips, Phil Peltier, Zari all coming up in the near future who will then need their own opportunities in the NHL and if Dubé's not cutting it, well, there's potential from other people as well. So, like, it's a good motivating factor for Dubé in order to get those next steps. I think it's motivating for him, but I think it comes back to our discussion about Valimaki last week as well, which is you can only, you know, you can only motivate so much without letting the player do the thing. And, I, I you know, I think if they don't start defining his role, you can only motivate him or say, go do it so much. And I think really what he needs to me 
I think he needs a consistent line because we've kind of seen him moving around with various guys during his NHL career, and I think he needs at least one partner, which we've seen him with Lucic a lot, and to define where they want him to go. They might change that next year, but say, Dylan, for this year, this is your role. Especially if you want to be a second-line guy. I think there's merit to him being a bottom six guy who can do everything well. And I think more and more in the NHL, we're seeing bottom six guys making a living because they can do enough things well that some team will bring you in because, well, you can do a little bit of everything. We'll fit you where we need you. And I I don't know that I see Dylan Dubé as a full-time second-line player on this team, just looking at the six that are above him, um, but maybe somewhere else. But I think if if the Flames are kind of looking at him as a, you know, second line, middle six type guy, I think you've got to keep him on the wing, keep him out of the center ice position, and just let him sort of mature. And you you know now enough that he's got a little bit of every talent, like you said. Pick one and run with it. Yeah, and to be fair, like, Dubé is still really young. 23, yeah. Yeah, and for an NHL player who's not a star, like, that's fairly young. And he still has plenty of time to figure out exactly what he is. So it's, how would you say, urgent but not urgent? Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not trying to say that we need him to, you know, figure out his potential tomorrow. But I think we've got to give him a role that he can grow into. And just so far right now, it seems like he has no role. He's just, you know, Calgary Flame number nine. If there was movie credits, he often seems like just Calgary Flame number nine. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that he should, you know, necessarily... Um, so, Matt, I mean, I don't know if you can name anybody else, but I can't name a guy, if you think he's going to be sort of a, a everyday top six, who sort of just did a little bit of everything, floated around, had to develop himself, and became that top six. Usually those guys have a role they're given, and they grow into that role from about 23 to 26 years old, and I just feel like Dubé hasn't been given that role yet. Yeah, and we saw that with Michael Backlund, and... Uh, Backland, he was basically given the, you're the penalty killer guy, go out there and kill those penalties and just don't give up Even goals. before that, I think the Flames were looking at him as sort of being, you know, they're one of their top offensive guys when he was first drafted. Yeah, oh, for sure. And then they were like, yeah, well, that's not happening, so let's make you that penalty killer. And, you know, to the Flames credit, they have been working with Dubé defensively. And you are seeing him out on the penalty kill. It's just, you know, more and more he needs to get those opportunities. Do you think Dubé's upside is as high or higher than Mangiapane? I'm not even close as Mangiapane. So if we were to look at kind of where Dubé goes in the future, Dubé's not going to be on our first line. Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk. Down the road, um, I mean, you know, We've got a couple years left in the Backland deal. Let me see exactly how many years. We've got two year, three years left. Do you think we could see a spot where Dubé, you know, develops over three years, and then when Backland leaves, Dubé becomes that elite, as you said, defensive forward? That could very and well happen. The top six. It, it's one of those that I think that like over the next year and a half, that you'll see that foment. Yeah, I think the year and a half is a good timeline for him to either. Um, develop or kind of stay, I don't want to say in mediocrity, but sort of just stay as another generic bottom six guy around the league. Yeah, like, basically, like, if he stays pat to where he is, you're basically looking at, like, another Mark Jankowski level, kind of okay generally, but if you turf him for somebody else, are you going to notice? Not really. Well, I don't even know if it'll be turfing him, but I could see him wanting to go somewhere else to try and get a True. bigger opportunity, like Jankowski did. True. And it's you know. one one of those things that this team um, just needs to be paying attention and cognizant. And also allowing other guys, if they're ready, like uh, Peltier is looking really ready for the NHL soon, that, you know, that might come at an expense of a guy like Dubé as well moving forward and not necessarily this year but soon i think if i'm looking at that and this is just me i think if i'm looking at um you know replacing someone in the lineup i think dubay's got enough rope with this team that he'll be there for a while i think when i look at guys that peltier or rujichka are going to replace richardson lewis those like i think there's some easy guys to pick off for next year yeah definitely 
And I, I don't know we're going to bring, you know, more than two or three rookies up at once, especially if they're playing, you know, in the bottom six. So I think it's going to be easy to replace what we've got. Mm-hmm. With uh, what well, we're talking about, some of those young guys, let's talk about Adam Rzyczka here. Adam Rzyczka is a, a bigger kid, six foot four, 203 pounds. He's a left shot centerman. So another centerman here. And it seems like a lot of our young guys on the team right now are uh, wingers, or at least, you know, guys like Dubé who we're talking about, Manjapani, some of those younger, um, hungry players. So nice to see a centerman there. And I would say, if nothing else, like I've seen some of his work in Stockton. You and I have seen him at rookie camps. We've seen some of his junior work. I think this is a prototypical power forward, Adam Ruzhishka. Do you think that's fair to say, Matt? Yeah. Um, 10, 10 goals, 6 assists, 16 points in the HL this year. I believe he was the points leader in the league when the Flames brought him up. Yeah, uh, if not very close. Do you think that Rajishka is a guy who will stay with the team this year? Do you think this is a cup of coffee and we send him back down? Uh, probably a cup of coffee, but let's see how he does during that cup of coffee. And I think that will inform the team like, oh, you need to work on X, Y, and Z. I agree. I don't know that bringing a guy up who's doing that well to play fourth line minutes is a smart move. I think if you know if this guy's playing fourth line or first line minutes in the A, you want to send him back down to get him time. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, like you, uh, you don't want Rajitska being in over his head as well. And like if he's say being forced to play on the second or third line, he might get overwhelmed at that. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. But I, I don't think there's any room on the second or third line right now for him to play. Sure. You know, I mean, if he's a centerman. So if Backlund, who's, let's call Backlund our number two center, if Backlund goes down, Mon- Monaghan jumps in there, right? So I think the like the highest Rajishka goes at this point is the third line. I even think the Flames might put Dylan Dubé on the third line at center before they put Rajishka there. I mean, and if we lose Backland and Monhan at the same time, we're probably screwed anyways. Yeah, like, and you can't really point to any team that loses two of their top three centers and just is able to roll along. So I, I don't see any any way that Rajishka plays higher. And I know a lot of times Flames fans say, call up so-and-so, even Peltier or these guys. I don't know that calling them up to play on the fourth line is the best for their development. I mean, it's nice to see them. It's nice to get a look. But I'm not sure that bringing those guys up to play seven minutes a night is really helping them all that much. You know, Rajishka, yeah, they tried it. But I agree with you, Matt. He's not going to stick around. I think this is a cup of coffee. I mean, he's playing with two veterans. Lots to learn from Trevor Lewis and Brad Richardson based on whatever you think about them. They've got a lot of NHL knowledge, but I think uh, I think he's he's going back to a- the AHL sooner rather than later. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing. And, you know, he scored his first NHL goal. I don't expect that to be his only NHL goal, and we just have to see whether or not he's able to turn that um, slowish start um, in the, the NHL around a bit yeah i don't even know if i'd call his start slowish well uh how would you say um he didn't seem like because like i have seen him play a little bit in stockton this season and he was a little bit more engaged in the play and like he was just a little too passive at times which is understandable yeah, and again, who knows what the coach is telling them? Who knows if maybe they're trying to give him a different role and he's having to think too much when he's out there. But I think that his points tell a lot of the story. 16 points start the season. I mean, even if he's looking a little passive, he's getting the job done. Yeah, and, you know, uh, the big knock on him when he was drafted was consistency. And if he can learn to bring that effort consistently, then he will find, you know, because anytime you have a six foot four player, that guy's going to get a job somewhere if he can play. And, and he's probably going to get more opportunities than maybe he should, even if he's not consistent, just because of that. I mean, you and I even talked about that years ago with Keegan Kanzig, probably around the organization more than he should have been just because he was a big boy. Yeah, same with Hunter Smith. Like, it was literally, yeah. they're huge. Okay, awesome. Pretty much. They weren't, They weren't. I think, panning out the way the organization wanted them to, but they were big boys. So let's keep them around, and they probably got more pro time than they should have. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't know what Dubé's potential is. I don't know with Rajichka, but I think 
Dubé, just like you said, has to get a role and keep playing at the NHL level. And I think really Rujic has to play in the AHL this year if he's going to keep developing. Yeah. And, like, frankly, like, of the guys in Stockton, the three that I see, like, am most immediately ready are Rujitska, Pospisil, and uh, Peltier. I think Pospisil you could bring in on one of your bottom six, like, as one of your bottom six guys. Is he? He's a winger, isn't he? Yeah. So you could easily bring him in for Lewis or Richardson. Rajishka, same thing. I don't think you bring in Peltier, though, to play fourth-line minutes. Like, and the only way Peltier comes up here is if Trishan Monan gets dealt. Yeah, I agree. You know, And you and I have talked about this before. My belief is don't just bring a guy up to put him in the lineup. Bring a guy up to put them in to fill a spot similar to theirs. So if there's an injury and we need a guy, then maybe Peltier comes up. Or you know, you're filling a top three center hole. But I think sometimes you, you're bringing up a guy who's used to playing 17, 18 minutes, even 12 minutes a night, and you're asking him to play five minutes, and it really screws with your game. Oh, yeah. Well, especially, like, hockey players are tend to be creatures of habit, which is why, like, basically universally everybody hates afternoon games. It doesn't matter which fan base, which team. Like, all the players kind of are like, oh, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Why am I playing hockey? <laughs> And, you know, you're seeing that, um, like, where, you know, if a player is used to playing 15 minutes plus, say, penalty kill time or power play time, and then they're being thrown in a completely different scenario than they're used to, it, like, it just from a muscle memory standpoint, like, you need to be able to adapt to that, and that takes time to learn how to play the five minutes. Plus. And I'm not sure it's a fair evaluation of that player no. you brought up if they're not playing their game. No, because, you know, they're just like, okay, I'm a warm body at that point, and, you know, like that's yeah. not really helpful to anybody. I mean, I'm not convinced Sean Monaghan ends the seasons of flame. I wouldn't be surprised either way, but I'm not convinced he ends the seasons of flame. I think they want some help, and I think Monaghan might be the – chip that can get them the best return with the least impact to the lineup and that's where then you might need to bring up a you know a guy like Peltier to fill a bona fide center spot yeah I can see that um, you know you and I talked about when we've talked in the past and when we had our guests a couple weeks ago talked about some trades here I just I think the Flames want some help and I think you know looking at the roster you're not going to trade any of your top three you're not you're not trading Coleman Backlund Mongepani I don't know that Dubé gets you a lot. No one's taking the Lucic deal. No one wants Richardson or Lewis. So, really, Monaghan's the piece you could move, I think, and get the the best return for. And, yeah. then, you've got, and then you've got an open center spot. Well, and that, that's where, like, Calgary right now is in that uh, situation in terms of the cap where you're going to have to start seeing some players mm -hmm. that you might not want to see get dealt dealt just because we need their cap hit and you know like i could see them trying in the off season like especially if lucic has a good season of trying to trade like the final year of his deal just to Was free up one year i think that becomes a movable deal yeah and especially like if he carries on his streak and say finishes with like north of 15 goals like then all of a sudden that actually becomes an actual viable contract at that rate even, even at if, dollar, you know, amounts and and, and Yeah, and. even if we had to swallow a million of it or something like that. Yeah. Which it's like, okay, fine, sure. <laughs> you know, like it, it Yeah. And his like, banker it, won't like it, he'll be getting checks from three teams at that point. Yeah. Well you saw it like it, this off season, like when uh or last off season when that the, they moved out T J Brody and a handful of other things. But yet replaced them with guys like Tanev and, you know, recycled the dollars into other venues. Like, I think that we're going to see that kind of a situation again. And, and my only worry with us being good this year is we got two big contracts need to be resigned, And the better we are, the bigger those numbers are going to be for both uh, Matthew Kachuk and Johnny Goudreau. Yeah, well, I'm kind of already penciling in like 1050 on each, give or take. 
So that's a lot of money we're going to have to clear. Yeah. And, yeah, like, that's basically a Monaghan-level contract that has well, to go and, away. And going back to Dubé, I mean, Dubé's making 2-3. As much as we like him, the team may have to look at it economically and say, that money's got to go. Because realistically, Matt, we could probably replace that with, I mean, where he is in the lineup, he probably plays with a million and a half or less. Oh, yeah. Well, and, like, that's why, like... um when we've had our draft preview shows, uh, like why I've always suggested, like with late round picks of selecting skill guys over uh, your random plug guys, because you can just go sign the actually developed guy for like a million, million and a half. And like with Dubé, like if you're needing to go in a di- different direction with his dollars, you can find an adequate replacement for that that level of dollar. Yeah, probably not, not a 23 to... year old, but someone of no. equal talent. Yeah, but you know, at that rate, like even if it's a 32 year old, like it doesn't matter because you're just filling that specific role. And you know, if it's like a million and a half, and you're saving a million dollars, well, hey, that's something that you can go spend on a more impact player instead. Or so, pay that 20 million dollar uh, cap cap hit that you think is coming. Yeah. And then the last big story I wanted to chat about this week, Matt, is you and I had uh, quite a debate last week, and things happened, and we're back to where we started. You and I had a debate last week about Yusuf Alamaki and what should the Flames do with him? Should he play in Stockton? Should he play in the IHL? What's best for his development? And pretty much the day after the show uh, launched, he got sent down to Stockton, and I sent you a text message saying, Hey, Matt, did you see what happened? And a lot of people on Twitter mentioned it too. And uh, yeah. He spent the weekend in Stockton. It's almost like Weekend of Bernie's the sequel. Weekend in Stockton. Uh, he played both games against San Diego, got three points and a plus three, uh, playing with Connor, Colton Pullman, and now guess what? He's been called back up. Yep. Why it's not? It's like, you know, they kind of sent him down when they were getting uh, to California. Say, we're going to go this way, you go that way, we'll meet back up at the airport. Yeah. Um, hey, they Tyler Waterspooned him. That's a good way to look at it. Wow, there's a name I haven't heard in a long time. And, you know, I think, I don't know how long he's going to stay this time, but I think after that San Jose game, there's a lot to be desired from the defense, as we talked about earlier. I think that this is his chance to finally show what he's got, and I think this is his chance to, as you were saying earlier, he needs, or what you said last week, not earlier this show, but, you know, earlier, the I guess, previous episode, he needs a chance to show what he's got. And I think now... Daryl's probably going to take Zadorov out. I mean, it could be Zadorov, could be a Branson, either way, and give him a shot and say, all right, kid, show us what you got. And I think he's going to be on short leash, though. I think if he goes back to the way he was, he's going back to Stockton quickly. Yeah, well, and I think that's the case with a lot of the development of the younger players. Like, they have to start to show Daryl some sort of former movement in their development. And sometimes that's the case other times not so much and you know it'll be interesting to cover over the next few weeks as these kinds of roster situations get sorted out the flames have wanted to sort of have extra bodies with them i think during these long road trips and that's really i think why uh Rajishka came up i think that's a big reason why valimaki was still here but the road trips are getting shorter now. I mean, if we take a look, we've got one more road trip this month. It's a two-game road trip, Chicago-Nashville. Um, maybe you keep them up for that. And then there's only one other road game, which is on the 30th, um, before a big swing in January. So I, I'm kind of thinking that they'll they'll keep Valimaki here for the homestand, the uh, Carolina-Boston homestand. And I think you could see him go back as early as Sunday to Stockton. Because with uh, of the next what one two three four five six seven eight nine ten games, seven of them are at home. So I think in in that case you're going to start seeing you know maybe we don't need to carry as many guys and we also saw Michael Stone this week we didn't talk about that earlier and Michael Stone as always looked good enough when he steps in after a long you know stint of not playing. So I think with that too you can say okay Stone is good enough to be our number seven. Oh well, for sure. Um, you know S- Stone. When was the last time Stone looked bad? I uh, you pretty much have to go like like right back to when like he first got back from his first injuries, like before he got bought out the first time. 
I mean, that's why he got bought out, because he wasn't looking good. Yeah, and then, oh, hey, we need a body. Hey, you're actually playing good again. Yeah. Well, we'll just keep you around forever and ever and ever. And you know what? He's he's showing he can do it. And I think, you know, especially for a long homestand, I think you can get away with one less defenseman um, on the roster. I think you'll probably see Rajishka not sticking around that much longer either for the same reason. Um, but I, I can see... I can see Valimaki staying here for, let's say, this the rest of this week and then being sent back. I can see one of two things. Either he gets sent back Sunday before the quick road swing or they want to keep a body for the road swing. They keep him here for Chicago, Nashville, and then send him back on the 15th before they're home to Toronto. But I can't see him lasting more than a week. I think by the 15th, he's back in Stockton. Especially with how good he looked in Stockton. I think he's kind of showing... I mean, you said last week he's too good for Stockton. I wouldn't disagree, but he looked really good down there, and I think he was starting to get into a bit of a groove. Yep. And did you see, what was it, yesterday? The Stockton Heat won 10 10 nothing in a game? 10-1. Uh, 10-1? Yeah. Former uh, Flames tryout Montana Onyabuchi scored the only goal for the other team. When was the last time you saw a pro hockey game that had a had 10 goals scored by one team. It's been a bit. That's got to be an AHL record. I uh, know. Uh, the AHL's been around a long time. I'm sure there's somebody who's gone off and scored like 14 or something. I don't know. I'm it's, pretty it's, sure it's a Stockton record. I just don't think it's It's, it's a, a Stockton record, um, and the Heat have earned at least one point in 14 consecutive starts from Dustin Wolf, which has got to be a record now, 2 12 2 and 0 um, but yeah, ten goals is definitely a Stockton record, but that's a that's a fairly new franchise. I guess it would depend if we look at Stockton's own franchise, if we do what the Winnipeg Jets did and they sort of, you know, retcon the old Jets with the new Jets, and are we looking at this as, you know, everything all the way back from the San uh the Saint John's Flames? Yeah. I always find that a little chintzy when that like, oh, this is a franchise record and you've been around for like two years. <laughs> Seattle, Fran- they get their first win, and we have the first win in franchise history. Historic. <laughs> That's right. I remember when I was playing hockey one year, and we played our first game of the season, and we won, and we came back, and our captain looked at the team and said, boys, we're undefeated. Yep. Sort of the same thing, right? It's like, yeah, franchise record, but the franchise has been around for one year. Like, wow, we've won two games in a row, the most ever in franchise history. <laughs> Miming a golf clap there. <laughs> we-, we have... Two saves in the period, most in franchise history. Because the well, first hey, period that's we the Matt Keatley special. He only faced two shots in his NHL career. Played one period, didn't let anything in. You keep bringing up these names today that I've totally forgotten about. Matt Keatley is a name I don't even know if he's still around. But wow, there's a, yeah. a guy that didn't play much. Oh, gotta dig the, out the obscurities. I think the last time I heard of him was uh, I think he played one season. <laughs> Yeah, he played, I think, one season with the Heat, the Abbotsford Heat, and then I remember him being in Victoria of the ECHL, and that was it. Uh, Looks like 2011-2012, he played in Houston and Bakersfield, and that was it. Yeah. So, oh well. At least he got to play some pro hockey. Yep. So a a lot of young guys to to talk about and I don't know about you Matt but it's starting to feel to me and we we get to this point every season you and I've talked about it before where it almost feels like the shoe's about to drop I think the Flames now know that they're good enough they're this isn't a you and I have talked about this. It isn't some sort of a bubble. This isn't a hot start. And I feel like the Flames want to make some changes. I think they know they need to make some changes. And it kind of feels like, I mean, knowing trees, probably talking to a lot of people, but I feel like every day when I wake up, I'm kind of expecting there to be news of a Flames move. Like, it just feels like tree likes to do things early. If you look at the, you know, the draft, the deadline, and it just kind of feels like he's he's going to be ready to improve his team soon. Yeah, like I would be somewhat surprised like if the Flames are going to add if it's not done before the Olympics even. Like I think that's like even though it's not technically the trade deadline, it's like if you're going to make an impact move, that's when it will be. Yeah, and I don't know if it'll be an impact move then, but I could see almost a change in scenery move. Moving a guy like Monahan who might be good with a change of scenery to someone else who might need that. I don't know that there's going to be an appetite from a lot of teams, unless you're dealing with someone who's out by then. Like, 
now that mathematically out, I don't know there's going to be a lot of appetite to make big moves at that time. Yeah. And we don't even know the, if the Olymp- what the Olympics will look like. I mean, I think a lot of those impact players might be over there, and I don't know they can be dealt while they're over there. No, I, I would be meaning, like, before the Olympics start even. Oh, like, okay. Yeah, not during the Olympics. Just, so like, before... Our, our last game is February 2nd, so somewhere around there. Yeah. Just so that way, like, even if, like, they're not playing actively in Calgary with and practicing with the team... At least they're having the ability to integrate culturally into the team. Trade deadline this year is April 12th. So, yeah, even if they did that, I mean, that's still two over two months until trade deadline. Uh, we will be at home on trade deadline day. So I think the Flames will still maybe have some work to do by April. But I can also see some other teams – who are on the bubble, maybe a team like, uh, you know, uh, let's say the Anaheim Ducks who think that they've got something, kicking the tires on Monaghan and trying to get that done early. Mm. I don't know if you trade interdivisionally, but I think that's the kind of team they might be talking to. Yeah, and we'll see. Um, there are so many permutations with this, and, like, especially, like, if the Flames do go on a protracted slump, like, that does change the calculus, too. So it's... I think a protracted slump or even just starting to figure out who's actually good. Like, I think we've probably all been surprised by Zadorov. Yeah. And I don't know that he's as good as he's looked, but if Zadorov starts to look not good or not as good as they want him to be, I could see them, even if they're not in a slump, saying we now know what pieces we're willing to move. You know, I don't know that they would actually... You know, I don't know how, what the buyers would be like, but, you know, even looking at the forwards, I think if we start to see some guys looking better than others, um, I, I think you start to say, okay, what piece? Because right now when I look around, I don't see a piece I want to take off the team. Um, but I think as even if we're not slumping, some of those guys are going to start saying, okay, we could do with him or without him. Yeah, and, like, Daryl has said that in the past that, like, this team is lacking in talent overall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and there are nights where you can actually plainly see that. And I think that in some format or another that that will be addressed. But what form that takes and how. And when. Yeah. Like, that's all up in the air. And I think that's largely, like, whatever the actual market dictates, frankly. Because, you know, like, you can go out and acquire anybody tomorrow... It's just how much you're wanting to pay for that. And I think that's a good point, too. I think the Flames are ready to make some moves. I'm not sure that we're, we have a dance partner yet. Yeah, because, like, frankly, other than, like, Montreal, there's not really anybody that's out of it at, by this point. And, yeah, it, you know, and Montreal only has basically Tyler Toffoli that would be of interest to us at this point. So, well, Or I think it's like we talked about, what was it, last week with moving Zadorov? I think... If, I think you might, uh, you know, you might see the Flames move like a, a defenseman for a forward or make some hockey moves. But, yeah, there's really no trade partner yet. Yeah. The only team that I can maybe see the Flames doing something interesting with besides Montreal, I could see the Islanders trying to spark things. They're not looking good, but they've got a roster that should be good. Yeah. I could see them trying to make a move. Uh, and you see a team do this every year. You see the team that's not doing great that tries to make a move for the sake of making a move. And you and I have talked about that in the past with the Flames. Should we make a move just to spark things? And I can see the the Islanders being the team that might try to make a move to make a move. And you could be the beneficiary of that. Yeah, and we saw that uh, the year that uh, Dion Phaneuf was traded. Like, the Flames were doing really good until December, January. And then, like, they got shut out in, like, three or four straight games and then couldn't win for, like, 12 or 13 in a row. And then the the Flames just finally said, yeah, enough of this, and traded Phaneuf, and then started systematically dismantling the team after that. And, you know, that could be a permutation as well for some teams. And if we look around, I mean, we've got, what, three, four, I'm trying to count in my head, teams without GMs right now? So I think, too, new GMs always have their guy or their preferences, and I can see there being some roster movement as new GMs come in and GMs want to make their own mark on a team or GMs say, I don't like this type of player. So I can see there, you know, I would even say by New Year's, 
I can see there being a couple moves made, whether Calgary's involved or not, just as new GMs settle in and want to put their mark on their teams. We, you know, we've seen Vancouver's going to need a GM. We've got a couple teams now that need a GM, and I and new coaches. And you know, yeah. I mean, Van, you know, new coaches may not want to work with a guy. Two guys might not get along. So I think anytime we're seeing those kind of front office shuffles, there's always movement that follows. Oh yeah, definitely. Like you take a look at Vancouver, and like they're a mess at the moment, and. You know, it, it, there's a lot of teams, frankly, that are just underperforming to such a significant extent that, you know, uh, basically I, those would be the teams where, like, nothing would be off limits if the deal made sense. I mean, the Flyers just got rid of Barube and brought in Mike Yo, and I think those are two very different, or sorry, Alan Vino, um and brought in Mike Yo, And I look at those guys, two very different coaches, and I can see guys that are, Doing well under Vino may not do well under under Mike Yo. So we'll we'll see if the Flames can be in on any of that as things are happening. But Matt, I think that's pretty much it for uh, Flames talk this week. Should we look at the predictions, or do you have anything else yeah, you want to go through? Um, no, it's just uh, interesting to see. Like this to me is like the first week where, frankly, the Flames played poorly throughout the week other than the San Jose game and Aiden Hill did kind of stand on his head yesterday as of our recording but you know like this is like the first real adversity this team has truly faced throughout the course of the season and so I'm mostly curious to see how like is this going to spiral and especially with the next two opponents being rather tough you know, like things could get out of hand quickly if they're not careful. And that's a worry I was having too. I mean, um, right now, Carolinas are a good team. I think that we got lucky with our first Boston game that I don't think Boston looked great, but I think Boston's always a team to be reckoned with. Um, and even Nashville, I think, could give us some troubles next week. Toronto. So I think we've got to really, in the next, let's call it 10 days, I think we've got some tough opponents here. And you're right, if the Flames can't, pick this up and you know start to really go back to the team they were i don't want to say that we're done because i don't think we are but i think we could have some struggles here and and struggles we're gonna have to work through maybe that's where guys need to be moved or changed or young guys brought up or lineups shaken up like i don't think the flames need to go out and start trading everybody but i just think that we might see our first rough patch every team has it and it'll be interesting to see how the players how the coach and how the management respond if it happens I'm hoping that this month, being at home as much as we are, they'll get things back on track. Yeah, well, it's also hard to live out of your suitcase for, like, the first two months of the season, practically. Yeah. And then be all gung-ho when you get home. Like, it's tough. And, you know, like, I don't envy the teams having to go through all of these ba- uh, baskets and that. Uh... And I think probably even less... I'll call it interesting to travel now than it was before. You probably can't go for dinner as much as you yeah. wanted to. You can't go out on the town when you're in Vegas, maybe as much as you want to, even if you're allowed to. Yeah. I bet the team's, you know, holding that back. So I think in yeah. a lot of ways, you know, you're going there and you're probably still like last year in the hotel, maybe eating at the hotel bar, going to the rink and going home. Yeah. Like there's not, a, you don't have the options. You're just, this is what you got. This is what you got. You're good. Yeah, so I can imagine it not being as fun to be out there doing some of that stuff. Which is good, uh, you know, and, like, you harken back to when uh, the Flames uh, were last under Sutter and Daryl had the team playing, uh, like, when they were at home, were in hotel rooms just so, like, to keep it as boring and consistently boring as possible just so they could focus and... You know, perhaps just even the fact of being at home, not having to deal with anything other than just, you know, hot home life, you know, might be a nice change of pace for this team. And that's what I'm hoping. Well, last week we had four games, and you and I both thought uh, we got, I mean, I guess we could say we got close. You got the two wins right, but you also added San Jose to your tally. Which didn't happen, and I thought we'd beat, we'd win LA, San Jose, lose Vegas, Anaheim. So I got the right number of wins, just not the right team. So uh, nobody won that week. I'm still surprised, Matt, that you're beating me one nothing so far. Yep. 
Well, let's look at this week. Um, we've got two games at home, two games on the road this week. The two games at home, the Carolina Hurricanes come to play Thursday at 7 p.m. And then Saturday, Hockey Night in Canada, of course, the late game versus Boston. Those are our two games yeah. at home. The Flames have a day off on Sunday, and then Chicago is a 5.30 Mountain Time start on Monday and a 6 p.m. start in Nashville against the Predators on Tuesday. So four games, what do you think? Well, Chicago-Nashville, they frankly should win just because they're better than those teams. Um, I'm going to go 2-2 two and two with them losing Carolina-Boston. I think that's the safe bet for this week. I think you're right. They should win Chicago, Nashville. Um, Carolina is going to be tough. Like I've been thinking, what do I predict for this one? I think Carolina is going to get the best of us. Um, I'm actually going to go the opposite way. I think they're going to struggle, but this year or this week, I think the only one they're going to win, and this is not going to be popular. I think the only one they win is Nashville. Yeah. No, I, I could see it. Like. How would you say, like, even before this week, there was little bits of sloppiness that was entering the Flames game. Uh, you know, and it was just minor things, and, like, they weren't as close to being a, as consistent with their efforts period to period, game to game. Like, they were still dominating, but it was waffling a little bit. But, like, this past week, it's kind of went off the rails a bit, and... It'll be interesting to see if they can reset for the Carolina game or not. And we've seen lines stapled to the bench for a whole period. Like, if you're not playing well, Daryl's not playing you. And I can see it getting to the point where, you know, guys are just getting stapled to the bench and we're shorthanded and there's frustration. Uh, and, I mean, we've seen this team get frustrated in the past. There's nothing to lead me to believe that yeah. this team is fundamentally different mentally. I no. think the frustration is going to creep in at some point. Yeah, no, and, like, we've seen, like, Kachuk got benched at one point, and then Dubé and Richardson, I do believe it was, got benched last week, and, you know, like, it, it's one of those things that, like, in order for the Flames to be successful, the attention to details has to be paramount, and the meticulousness of Daryl's system it being relentless all the time, like, it's hard to keep that up, but it's also the only way that like they've been consistently winning and frankly like even when they do lose like they're they're i don't really think they've gotten blown out this year like there's been games where they've lost by more than one goal but the the those goals are e extra empty net goals like i don't think the flames have lost by two or more where it's just like straight like losing by two plus uh, all season and and you were talking about the home advantage and being in their own bed i think just a lot of practice time on salad home ice is going to help to reinforce daryl's system as well yeah exactly like you're not having to go to the airport get loaded up on the plane fly get unloaded get to the hotel unpack a bit you know yada 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 like you're just okay i'm home yay Let's go drive to the cell dome and back. Yeah, and even when you're at the cell dome, it's familiar. In your locker room, your team meeting room, like uh, familiarity is often a good way to breed, a, you know, or to, to, I guess, grow a message. So say to breed success, but to, to grow that message and keep that message going and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, Matt, I think that's about it for this week. Do you want to take us out? Yeah, well, as always... Um Go Flames, go. And, you know, beat those pesky Bruins and Hurricanes just because they're good. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.